Fantastic. I'm going to let yourself introduce, actually. Oh, cool. Brilliant. Uh, hi. Well, my name is Richard. Um, I'm going to be talking about JVM profiling under the hood. Um, and what that means is we're going to be having a look at a few of the kind of problems you might encounter when you're profiling applications and some of the kind of workarounds and how profilers actually work and talk a little bit about measurement bias. But uh, before we kind of go deep diving into technology, does anyone remember, okay, it wasn't that recently, but not that long ago we had a new millennium, right? And I don't know you guys, but I'm not that old. This was my first new millennium. And at the time of the new millennium, we were naming everything millennium. There's millennium dome, millennium bug, all sorts of stuff. And we actually, in London, had this Millennium Footbridge built. Does anyone remember what the problem was with the Millennium Footbridge? <laughs> Horizontal resonance. Yes, it wobbled is the problem. Um, and does anyone remember why, despite all this technology, we ended up building a bridge that wobbled? Yes, well, uh, in simple terms, they were mo modeling the idea that people were walking on the bridge, but they didn't take account of the fact that actually there's some correlation between the way people walk. So there was a slight modeling error between the way they were understanding the data, and they ended up having to redesign some of the structural engineering of the bridge and add on a whole load more vertical supports. It's not necessarily directly to do with profiling, but just keep that idea in the back of your head. They had to redesign a whole bunch of stuff due to just a slight modeling mistake, a very, very subtle problem. Okay, so what about the structure of this talk? First of all, I'll talk a little bit about why we might want to profile to begin with. Then I'm going to talk about uh, different problems or biases that you might encounter when profiling and different problems, problems with profiling techniques, problems with profiling methodologies. Then we'll look under the hood about how profilers work, how we can solve some of those problems, and then we'll bring some of those threads together. Okay? So from time to time, this kind of thing happens in terms of our software application, right? We have some kind of bottleneck, and we want to find where the root cause of that bottleneck is. Um, and here it's pretty obvious what the root cause of the bottleneck for our traffic jam is. It's this massive bus right in the middle of the jam. But if we're looking about software, we might have a relatively complicated system, hundreds of thousands of lines of code, maybe millions of lines of code. It's not so obvious where the actual problem lies. And step one for many people when looking at a performance problem is this guy. Um, go and randomly guess at what the cause of the software problem is in, in, in question. Um, also, people have a kind of habit of going, well, it's this technology we're using. That technology is slow. Or um, they have a habit of going, we've seen performance problems before. The last time I encountered a performance problem, it was like this, performance tuning by, by folklore. What I actually would like people to do a lot more of is take measurements about their application data and use that data measurement to be a little bit more scientific, a little bit more rigorous. So you've got a performance problem. Where is that problem? That's a hypothesis to evaluate. Take measurements on CPU metrics, all sorts of things. Eventually, we want to find out where this application problem lies in terms of our code, and that's where profiling comes in. You might also engage in some exploratory profiling. So it's a common thing that people do to never profile their application at all uh, outside of performance bottlenecks. And that gives you this kind of weird situation when you do actually get a performance bottleneck. What's it meant to look like when things are running smoothly? What's going on there? So it's also helpful to do a bit of exploratory profiling before you hit a bottleneck so you have some kind of mental context for how your system be can behave. It's also incredibly useful for finding weird bugs. The number of times I've done some bit of profiling and gone, wait, why is that actually spending time there? It shouldn't be doing that at all. And it turns out that profiling can actually be quite a good way of finding bugs as well. Um, I went to a conference earlier this year, also in London, called DevOps UK. And there was a guy there uh, who gave a great talk called Sergei Kuksenko, who's one of the, the Oracle Performance Engineering team. And uh, Sergei had this long talk. He had this whole kind of um, series of things he was doing related to matrix optimizations. And he got to the end of the talk, and he, he, he drilled down. He looked at CPU cache profiling measurements, all the sort of things. And he said, performance is easy. All you need to know is everything about your software, application, JVM, hardware, and everything else. 
I'm not going to be talking about everything today. I'm, I'm just going to kind of narrow the scope a little bit and talk about one type of thing. Execution profiling is what I'm going to be talking about. Execution profiling is answering the question of where in my code is my application spending time. It can't tell you why it's there. It can't tell you perhaps actually it should be spending time there. It can't tell you whether it's necessarily spending time in a method because it's doing something stupid or, or maybe it's just, that's just inherent. It's just telling you where in your code is your application spending time. And in fact, this is not the only cause of performance problems, right? So this is a slide conveniently stolen from Zero Turnaround who did a massive survey of people looking what kind of performance problems people had. Loads of people had problems with database queries or GC logs or locking and IO. And this massive fat red blob over here, this inefficient application code, this type of problem is the kind of problem that we're gonna be really useful for spotting with execution profiling. So I don't wanna claim I'm solving everything, just some things. Okay, so we've said a bit about why we might wanna profile and why we would, what kind of problems we might be able to solve with execution profiling. Let's take a look at what the actual problems are with profiling. Profiling is, you know, I set it out to be this, this honest empirical investigation, right? We'll do some profiling, we'll find out where the problem is, and everything will be good. But the reality is a lot muddier and murkier. So there are multiple different types of execution profilers that we can think of in terms of. Firstly, there's instrumentation-based profilers. Instrumentation-based profilers take a method, and they'll add in a little time at the beginning and a little time at the end, and they'll subtract the time they've taken at the end from the beginning, and they'll say, right, this is how long a method call was, and then they'll log it somewhere. Okay, nice and simple. The problem with instrumenting, instrumenting profilers is they tend to have a huge, huge observer effect on the application that you're profiling. They can often skew the measurement of uh, uh, the application in terms of how long it takes. Uh, you know, you can easily get a two-fold, three-fold, even tenfold sometimes slow down from using an instrumentation-based based profiler. And if you have effects in terms of your application which are timing related, like back-offs and queues and things like that, you can have enough observer effect to completely ruin the application's behavior that you're uh, monitoring. So I'm not saying don't use instrumenting profilers, but it's not really the focus of this talk, and it's not really the focus of this talk primarily because of the, the skew that that observer bias has on the application itself. What I'm going to be talking about is sampling profilers. So, sampling profilers come along, you say, your application is running, you've got some threads, we're going to pause those threads, we're going to do a dump, and we're going to look at what each of those threads was doing. We're going to look at the stack trace there, we're going to aggregate those stack traces, and we're going to visualize the result to you. So, um, if you've got some application, which is maybe some web server, sitting there running in a big loop at the bottom, it's calling into some controller, so say here, handle a web request. It's reading some kind of person object out of a database or a file store, and it's instantiating some person, then it's gonna take that model that it's picked up and put it into a, uh, uh, some view code where it's generating some HTML. That is application time, and periodically it's gonna come along and interrupt the thread in some respect and sample what it's doing at that point in time. You'll notice that we have these little, little kind of question mark guys all over this slide as well. Those are things where the application could have been doing something where we have absolutely no idea because they were in between samples. And there'll be also a little bit of a cause of bias as we'll see as this talk goes on. So the idea here is, as I say, we sample this program of interval, we build up a distribution of time that we spend in methods. So if you see that, if you sample and you see that same method a lot, you know that that's the hot spot inside your application. But this relies on a bunch of assumptions about the way our application works. For a start, in some sense, we're trying to assume that this sampling process is random. Because if there's a bias in the sampling process, that means we're more likely to see certain types of methods and less likely to see other types of methods. Something can look like it's a hot spot and a big bottleneck, when in actual fact, we don't spend much time there, or vice versa. And we also have these problems that we're talking about sample time, the distribution approximating the genuine time spent distribution. So the first kind of problem that people might have with sampling profilers is just plain out, they don't have enough samples that they've collected in order to get a good enough picture of their application. 
One approach to that is to drop the sampling interval, so that's a, perhaps a more reasonable approach if you're kind of profiling in a development cycle or an isolated situation. If you're trying to do more kind of continuous profiling or profiling in production, the only real solution here is patience. You need to wait a bit longer to collect those samples. But you might find that if you extend that period long enough, you'll begin to get, what, get what's known as periodicity bias. So this is the idea that we repeatedly profile um, the application at a certain point in time, and we end up seeing the same thing because that's something which the application is doing. The sampling period accidentally correlates with some actual uh, common regular occurrence inside our application. If you're doing kind of regular development level profiling where you might sample every few milliseconds, this is quite unlikely to happen. But this is the kind of thing where if you do more kind of production profiling, where you'll profile once a minute or once an hour or something like that and try and build up a picture over a long period of time, and people sometimes do this in production so they don't have a, a particularly large overhead of sampling, then you can often hit this periodicity bias. So one approach to that is to shorten the interval, and as I say, works fine in development, but you can still increase your observer effect and you can slow down your system if you're doing genuine production profiling. So another approach in this situation is to start to randomize the interval at which you take your profiling samples. And that means you aren't sampling on a constant period. Another approach, the problem that people have, is that sampling is an inexpensive operation. Actually stopping those threads and doing something can be quite an expensive operation. One approach is to switch sampling method. We'll talk about other sampling methods and sampling methods in a sec. Another approach is just say, look, it, it kind of sucks, but maybe we're doing it in development. It might not be the end of the world. And obviously, there is also that longer sampling interval with the kind of caveat of periodicity bias that I talked about earlier. But what about the method itself? The sampling method can have a bias. So what does that look like? Well, let's look at some code here. So this is some code from uh, SpecJVM 2008. So SpecJVM 2008 is kind of an open source benchmark that JVM vendors use to say, look, our JVM's really, really fast. Trust us, go on. It, it's give, it gives us a big number on this benchmark. But it's actually quite a good benchmark in many respects. It's peer reviewed, it's put out by a quite well respected spec organization. It does a lot of things quite well. Um, people look at the benchmark, they evaluate it. It's the kind of thing which you might want to profile if you wanted to investigate. It's the kind of thing where you might say, this is the kind of thing where our profiler should work. So this is a one component in the benchmark, a successive over relaxation uh, benchmark. So it's basically solving a system of linear equations. And uh, I think the actual overall algorithm was briefly outlined in, in the keynote this morning, interestingly enough. So the body of the method has this big block of execute code. I don't want you to worry about what it's actually doing here, but suffice to say, it's doing some maths, and uh, this is where the actual benchmark gets run. And surrounding the execute method is this other method called measure SOR, okay? So measure SOR is a method that uh, calls the benchmark and actually times its execution. Okay, so let's run this benchmark and then, whoops, the daisies. And actually profile it using uh, JVisual VM using its sampling profiler. This is where the small screen resolution begins to doom us a little bit. Now, what's actually going on here? Well, the execute method was meant to be the actual benchmark method that we see in our application. And we'd expect, if the spec organization had written a good benchmark, that the wrapper method, this measure SOR, was very unlikely to crop up. And we'd expect its self-time in profiling to be incredibly low. When we profile it with JVisual VM, we find that it believes that nearly 63% of time was spent in this measure SOR method. It doesn't even think that the execute method was ever called. So there are two possible reasons why this is the case. 
Number one, spec could have done just a really bad job with a benchmark, and maybe the JIT compiler just optimized the way the entire benchmark at runtime. That's a thing that can happen with benchmarks. Another thing that could have happened is maybe this profiler is not actually being as honest as it claims it is with respect to where we spend application time. So, given this section of the talk is called lies, damn lies, and statistical profiling, you can probably figure out which one is the actual answer here. Before I go on, I'd just like to mention and explain why that is. I'd just like to mention that this problem we're going to be talking about isn't just a, an issue that's limited to one profiler. Uh, this is another survey talking about how frequently people use different profilers. And this guy, this guy, this guy, um, or that guy, and that guy all have this same underlying problem because they use the official API for profiling, which is where this sample bias is coming from. Um, Lord knows what the problems are in the custom in-house tools that people have developed, but uh, that's, another, that's another matter. So how do people profile with the JVM? <coughs> well, there's a thing called the JVM TI, which is the interface for writing profilers and debuggers and tooling stuff. And it's got a method in there called get call trace. And get call trace sits there and blocks. And what it does is it tries to stop the entire JVM, collect a load of information about the stack traces, and then return it back to the profiler, okay? That process of trying to stop all the threads has a very large impact on the application, so it can be an expensive sampling method, and it only samples are what's known as safe points. So, what's a safe point? Well, it turns out that JVMs need to stop your code in order to do a whole bunch of different things. One of the things they need to do is garbage collect, Another thing they need to do is op they often optimize locks under the hood, so they replace different forms of locks by other forms of locks. A bunch of other cleanup work and internal data structure work that JVMs do under the hood at safe points. And another thing that they have to do at safe points is collect the, the stack traces. So if you have a safe point at some point in time, which I've represented by these nice green lines, you'll get a profile at that point in time. If it happens that other parts of your application don't have a safe point in, maybe, you aren't actually going to collect the stack traces at that point in time. So, what's actually going on with safe points? JVM threads periodically poll um, a page and say, give me some data. They periodically poll this flag. And at some point in time, one thread flicks that flag and says, guys, stop what you're doing enter a safe point. We want to do some VM operation. Call into this other code. Now, when it happens in terms of your application depends upon a bunch of different factors. Modern JVMs have a uh, kind of adaptive optimization system as part of their just-in-time compiler where they interpret code for a while, profile it whilst interpreting it, and then successively JIT compile it. So if you're running it in the interpreter mode, between every two bytecode instructions in your application, it'll do a safe point poll. If you're in uh, the compilers, C1 and C2, you'll get it on the back edge of an uncounted loop. So when you've got a loop, you're kind of going around and back edge when you're about to pop up to the top. And an uncounted loop, what does that mean? It's a kind of fuzzy heuristic. So if you have a certain type, you know, a lot of common loops have this common pattern where you go four, i equals zero, i less than some constant, i plus plus. That's what we call a counted loop. Um, in kind of compiler terminology, we're gonna say that the, the loop condition uh, relies on a comparison between a loop dependent variable, that's a, uh, a variable that increases by a constant amount each loop, against some kind of constant which is known at the compile time. So that's a counted loop. So the JVM says safe points are expensive, will optimize away safe points at the top of counted loops. Turns out that, hey, guess what? Lots of performance critical code has counted loops in. Even worse, some dastardly people, myself included, have also recognized that this is a potential optimization you could perform, um, and it's possible to simulate an infinite loop and convince the compiler it's counted by starting at zero, incrementing by two, and then saying less than integer dot max value, because that's an odd number, so it just kind of skips, overflows, and loops around. Um, so you can do that kind of trick with the uncounted loop and cause your application to never, never hit a safe point in an infinite loop. 
also method, exit, and entry. Now, method, exit, and entry sounds like a really good one, right? We've got lots of method, exits, and entries, especially if we're writing these nice, small, readable, usable functions. But unfortunately, as part of the optimization system, the JVM will also inline functions, because function calls have a cost associated with them, and consequently, they will remove some of the safe points at that point in time. So inlining can have an effect upon where safe points happen as well. There's also a safe point on a JNI call, so that's calling to native code from JVM code, but only when it exits. So that means if you've got a thread that's sitting there in native code for ages as it's running, there's no safe points during that entire period of time. Don't worry, it gets worse. So there's time to safe point. So that's the time it takes your application to actually reach a safe point. So we talked about some of the factors that can slow that down. Um, <clears throat> by default, by the way, if you're ever looking at GC logs, time to safe point is not included in GC logs, even though they need to reach a safe point to GC it. So you need to pass that, app, that flag to a hotspot JVM to print out that time as well. So what happens here? All of our threads come along. We have this flag set where it's a safe point at this point in time, and at some point in time, they have to wait until they all get to this common safe point, this global safe point that happens across all threads <coughs> in order to collect the stack traces. Yeah. This safe point can be delayed by, as I say, very large methods, uh, long-running counted loops. It can also be delayed by anything else. So if one of the threads in your application has a page fault or some OS level pause, if a thread gets suspended or pulled off a CPU, it can't hit its safe point unless it's actually scheduled on the CPU, and it can't collect the stack traces until, it's hit a schedule, into, until we've hit a safe point. But it gets worse, because even though we have all the threads hitting a safe point, which you might think that means you can pull the stack traces for all the threads, what actually happens is when the profiling API tries to read a thread, it reads one thread, sorry, it calls a safe point, it reads the data out of one thread, and then it continues. And then it calls for a safe point, reads for another thread, and then continues. So if you say, get me, get me that call trace, give me all those stack traces, that means you need to have a safe point per the number of threads on your application, and all these pause effects can get multiplied. Now, at this point in time, I hope you're a wee bit disappointed. As disappointed as somebody who ordered the English dessert classic, Sticky Toffee Pudding, and was unfortunately presented with the uh, fusion cuisine gastronomic failure, Sticky Toffee Roulade. What's that? That's, that's nothing. Okay. So, uh, let's see if we can do um, a better job, shall we? Let's switch to a different profiler and... Um, <coughs> Run the same benchmark. It's going to take a little bit of time. So the idea is that we've got all these problems related to biases in sampling, and they are related really to that sampling methodology. So if you can take a different sampling methodology, we can get more accurate information. This is where the, the alternative programming language conference aspect of this talk's come in. The alternative here is that we pick a different sampling methodology. When this benchmark finishes, lovely. So here's a different profiler. It's a wee bit ugly. And whilst that profile was going on, it dumped out a log under the hood of a uh, file that represented the execution run that we did. Now, text is a bit small. You might not be able to see it at the back. But conveniently at the top, it's got the execute method of the SOR benchmark taking up 93.1% of the time. So this is actually, I believe, an accurate measurement. Um, so conclusion reached, the spec guys didn't do a bad job, but our other profiler ignored a method which was 93% of the application's runtime due to its profile bias. Okay. I know what you're thinking now. Why the heck did they serve a roulade? Why didn't they just serve the sticky toffee pudding? No. How does this actual work? What's the difference in terms of the implementation between a more accurate profiler and the J Visual VM approach, which was not so strong? Well, it turns out there's not only a get call trace method, 
There's also something called async get call trace. So this is a kind of an unsupported, undocumented API um, that's living in JVM code. But conveniently, it's likely to live in JVM code for quite a while, actually, because it's the, actually the profiling mechanism used by a product called Oracle Solaris Performance Studio, which, despite the name, was not written by Oracle and doesn't only run on Solaris. So that's glorious. Um, there was an open source prototype of some code put out there on the async get call trace front by a guy from Google called Jeremy Manson, which the profiler in question I've just showed is kind of an adapted version of. So async get call trace is a way of saying, right, I've got this thread, stops, just give me the stack traces of my, the information, walk the stack, give me all the data back from that, from that method call. The question is, how are we going to run the async get call trace without having this big global save point mechanism? Well, it turns out <coughs> the operating systems have had something called uh, a sigprof signal in them for donkey's years. This is vintage profiling, great stuff, tried and, trusted, tried and tested techniques. So you've probably heard of like sigint or sigkill for shutting down processes. You can also get your OS to send you the sigprof interrupt on a periodic timer. Okay, so it's managed by your operating system. And it, what it says to the CPU is generate an interrupt on that CPU core. I know which thread is associated with that core. It's registered an interrupt handler for that interrupt, and it will allow you to register a callback to then be called associated with that interrupt handler. Now, it's used by the profile I just showed a second ago, which is Honest Profiler, and it's also used by a few other profiles, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, yes. So how does this kind of mechanism go on? Well, our timer thread um, in the OS is periodically called signal. And uh, what happens is, as I say, there's an interrupt fired. The OS has registered an interrupt handler with that interrupt. That can then call into our code so we can register a handler with it. We can then call async get call trace for the thread that we're on. And then we can send that data off somewhere else to be processed. OK? So how does that work? Well, there are certain limitations on what code you can run inside an operating system managed signal handler. Um, you might think, oh, that doesn't really sound like the end of the world. But you can't call malloc, you can't lock anything, and you obviously can't write to a file. You probably wouldn't want to anyway, because you're actually interrupting the application code whilst doing that. But you basically can't do any of the stuff that you really want to do. It's like writing kernel drivers or something like that. It's just, just terrible. So our OS timer thread is going to call some signal handlers on these threads to be run. And they need to just take that data and copy it somewhere. So in our case, and in fact, in pretty much anyone who's using this as case, they will have a lock-free um, buffer. So I've just got a kind of simple lock-free lock ring buffer, multiple producers, one consumer. Um, data gets copied into there. And then we can have another thread which processes that ring buffer, says, what's that magic number that corresponds to that method? We'll look at the method name and all this other useful information that you need, dump it into a log file, and then our log file can either be read on the fly by another process or read offline by another process. So pretty simple approach. But there's a number of limitations to this. Firstly, it only profiles running threads, so we'll have a look at that in a second. The accuracy of line information is also limited by reality. So well, what I mean by reality, I'll explain that in a second as well. Unfortunately, um, it only reports Java thread frames and threads. So if you're profiling native code, it can say you're in native code, but it doesn't have the debug information to say this is the blob of native code that you're actually calling. And it also needs to look at the debug information during call. So it's still not completely free. It's faster, it's better, but it's not perfect. Okay. So what do I mean by line number accuracy? This is actually a bug that pretty much all profilers suffer from. When you're at a point in time, all you know is the program counter for that point in time. And that program counter um, uh, isn't quite as simple as just executing one instruction at a time. Modern CPUs, superscalar, execute multiple instructions in parallel. Which of those executions do you associate that time information to when you do a sample? Who knows? It's called SCID. 
No one's, it's like an unsolved problem, this area. There's, there's always some skid difference. The reality is that you're usually close enough to your point to get there. But yeah, profile, program counters within some skid distance. Also, uh, you need to be a little bit careful. So you need to add that command line option when using the profiler, documented, uh, to say actually generate all the information, the debug information associated with bytecodes, because uh, otherwise the JVM won't generate informa debug information that's not at safe points, because it doesn't need it normally. Okay, so that's the limits of line number accuracy. The other thing is, let sleeping dogs lie. So the blocking get call trace uh, API call sampled all the threads, even the threads which were sleeping. So this is something we didn't actually want because it meant that um, we'd be waking up sleeping threads and having more observer bias, more impact. But it does mean that suppose you've got an application which spends most of its time sleeping. So here's another visual VM sample. So I've just got a very simple application that just sits there in a loop and it's sleeping. If I profile this with, so this is actually Java Mission Control, which is another profiler, but uses the same mechanism under the hood that I've just described. Only four samples, as you can see on, on the right-hand side, so not enough samples to draw a strong conclusion off. And um, it doesn't know about the sleeping bit at all. It's just not visible, because it couldn't sample when it was sleeping. So you have to bear that in mind as well. The question is then, we've got all this quite complicated mechanics, right? We've got lock-free ring buffers, we've got threads, all this stuff. Why would you actually trust the results? And why would you trust that this profiling mechanism is more accurate? And I think this is a great case where open source is a really useful tool when you're thinking about measurement tools and measurement biases. So let me just give you an example of a bug, which I would never have spotted on my own in a million years, and someone else who was reviewing the code externally spotted for me. So you remember earlier on, I said, uh, you couldn't call certain types of methods when you're in that signal handler. You couldn't allocate memory, you couldn't hold locks. Another thing you can't call is memcopy, which is a bit annoying, actually, because you want to copy the block of memory to somewhere else. So I wrote, like, very dumb, simple, don't actually care, but it works fine, memcopy function. Just takes a pointer, reinterpret, casts it, copies the stuff over, and blats it. Sorry, that's not memcopy, that's memset. Sets all the data back to zero, because I, I want to reset some buffer. Okay, so I've got the mem set there. What is going to happen when the compiler, GCC, comes along and optimizes mems, my, my safe mem set function? It does this. So um, uh, uh, RDI and RSI are units calling conventions for where we get command line parameters. So this is basically saying, get me the length of the array that I've passed in and plop it into the RDX register, compare it against RDI, and if it's zero, jump to here. So what that says is basically, if you're trying to copy an empty block of data, uh, just return, we don't need to do anything. Can you read what that says? Jump to memset. It turns out the GCC goes ahead and tries to optimize your safe reset function just to use memset. Why is this? Well, loads of people NIH their own memset for all sorts of daft reasons. It'll do the same thing if you try and write a fake memcopy function as well. Most of the time, it's just a bad idea. And it doesn't know that this code is only going to be run in the signal handler, and it's not safe to call memset. So it's doing like a completely rational thing without any domain knowledge. So compilers, are they our friend or are they our fiend? Who knows? Um, but yeah, the point was that bug was uh, reported by a guy called Rajiv Signal, who I've never met, I don't know him, reported an excellent bug report. Also reported a bug related to the lock-free ring buffer. Um, a number of bugs have come in uh, pointing out very, very detailed subtleties around race conditions, around startup, whether things don't work on different platforms. And most importantly, by having open source tooling, you can actually understand the profiling methodology and the sampling mechanism, and it's possible to actually understand what's going on under the hood with these profiles. You can see where the biases are. You can know what, what information to trust and what not to trust. Um, as I said, it's open source. The code is there. Thanks to a bunch of other people who have helped. Nitsen's great contributor, and Google and Jeremy Manson for the original uh, contribution. But it is a bit rough around the edges, and it's not the only solution to accurate profiling on the JVM. So I also want to talk about a few other things which have nice profiling characteristics. 
Firstly, there's native profiling tools. So your CPU has the ability to measure certain hardware level instructions that happen, hardware performance event counters. <clears throat> and you can read off the registers where it dumps those information. So you can say, how many instructions have we executed? How many cache misses do we had? You can cor correlate application performance with hardware performance. And it's very useful if you're trying to do more low level optimizations. Perf is the Linux profiling tool. <coughs> And there's some people who've brought out this Java perf mapper agent. So that's like a Java profiling agent that hooks up to perf and uses the perf tool. As I say, perf suffers from skid, that, that factor about the, the instruction level, perhaps a little bit more than some of the other things. But uh, it does work very effectively. It's integrated into JMH, which is a Java benchmarking tool, all sorts of things. And the perf mapper agent's getting more mature as well. So that's another completely open source free tool that provides accurate profiling information. There are some things which perf is worse at. A good example is perf can't profile any code in the interpreter because there's no generated code for it to associate the instructions with. So it's also not a panacea, but it's another interesting one. There's Java Mission Control. Java Mission Control is an excellent profiler for development. It's built into the JVM. You need to use the uh, kind of Oracle proprietary JVM. It's free for development, but it costs you some obscene, inordinate amount of money in production. You know, Oracle, what can you do? Uh, but Java Mission Control under the hood doesn't use the async get call trace call itself, but it uses a very similar mechanism. It uses SIGPROF based profiling. <clears throat> it copies all its data into a ring buffer. The overall design mechanism and implementation is very similar. So it's very, very good for this kind of stuff as well, and a lot more mature and tested. Um, except it might well seg fault the first time you run it on Linux, but that's another issue. Um, there's Solaris Studio, which is another tool. It's free. No one knows about it. Its UI is terrible, but it is actually very accurate. Again, it uses async get call trace, and it's the tool that originated the use of async get call trace. So again, very useful uh, kind of tool there. And uh, quick hands up, anyone using Azul Zing JVM at all? Oh, OK, not a Zing audience. Right, uh, alternative JVM. Key value add for them is that they've got a low pause GC. <coughs> but it also has a very good profiler called Z Vision or Z Vision. I never know how you're meant to pronounce this. Um, but uh, Z Vision also has accurate uh, sampling uh, techniques as well. Again, different mechanism because it's a different, J a different JVM. But it's got that similar kind of SIGPROF based profiling, pulling off into a ring buffer, same overall architecture. Very useful. So now, hopefully, you're as happy as someone who's realized that sticky toffee roulade still has loads of the sticky toffee stuff on top, which is what you wanted, and has a load of double cream next to it anyway. So it's all fine. Cool. So let's just wrap up and draw a few conclusions about what we've talked about. We said that profiles themselves have inherent biases associated with their profiling methodologies. The default out-of-the-box solution for JVM applications this covers Java, Scala, Clojure, Kotlin, Salon, whatever you name it, is not accurate. And even if you think you can get away with things by writing like small readable code, the JIT compiler will come along and inline your methods, if they're in a hotspot quite possibly, and remove your safe points and do all sorts of things. We've looked at a couple of different alternative profiling methodologies, focused on one big one, um, and shown how they can solve this problem. I demoed an application where 93% of the runtime disappeared in the profiler, but we could still see it in other profilers. And that's quite good. But there's also a much broader takeaway here, which is don't blindly trust measurement tooling. If someone's given you kind of a measuring device or a, a profiler, be it execution profiler or memory profiler, <clears throat> think about the way it works under the hood. I've seen people use things like memory profilers and overestimate their application allocation rates by literally 10,000 fold because the memory profiler itself disables optimizations that remove allocations. There's all sorts of things in tooling which give you biases to their, their collection mechanism. Okay? Don't blindly trust it. And that goes along with the idea of even if you're not using open source tools, try and figure out what they're doing under the hood. Actually test them, prod them, and poke them, see what's going on there. But if you can do it, the open source does enable implementation review. And you can see how JVM internals work. You can often talk to people about this kind of stuff as well. So that's, that's fantastic. But yeah, key point is 
regardless of whether it's open source or not, actually test those measuring instruments, actually prod them and poke them and see how they work and see what their biases are. Okay, that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much for listening. I'll give you an opportunity to ask some questions in a second. As well as doing development on this and a load of commercial work, I also do uh, some training courses, in-person training courses around functional programming in Java, which I've also written a book on. I also have some online courses on Pluralsight. And uh, my blog, perhaps a little bit more interesting for this specific audience because it has some more interesting articles of a kind of deep dive nature. That's me on Twitter as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed the talk. And if anyone's got any questions, now is a great time to ask them. Absolutely. Um, I think if you've got the time to have a look at it, it's, it's often worth having a look at something like JVisual VM as well. Um, you, I wouldn't say, as well as multiple profiles, it's worth approaching the problem from different directions. Execution profiles aren't the only thing which give us information around runtime uh, behavior. Uh, there's a lot of metric information. Um, a lot of tooling in the APM space as well, things like that, which are also provide valuable insights and also things like memory profilers can help as well. So that's good. So when you say that uh, the profiler won't be able to capture threads that are sleeping, uh, is that actually in like state sleeping? So if I'm waiting on a database query and the thread is simply waiting, am I able to uh, profile that or? Um, it won't profile it if the OS thread is in the OS sleeping state. So if you're doing like a busy wait, mm -hmm. you're okay. And the transition from busy wait to sleeping is like some sort of internal implementation detail that... <sighs> I don't know what would happen at that point. So, okay, so what happens, I'm pretty sure you'll find, is, is your, if you catch it in the method call bit where you're approaching hitting the OS code, you'll get it because you're still in JVM code and your application's still doing some work. Once you're down into actually in a sleeping state, you're doomed. So, but like, so concretely, if I'm like waiting on a countdown latch because I'm waiting for some, you know, response to come back from the network, uh, would that be captured by your profiler or not? Uh, it won't appear in your samples. Okay. Any other questions? profiler in production? Um, I think probably the biggest thing to be aware of is there's a bunch of C code in there. Um, and don't think that many people are using it yet. So if you find a bug, please do report it. But it's not in any way as uh, extensively tested or used or that kind of thing as some of the other tooling. Certainly, I, I think probably a better starting point for doing uh, more accurate profiling, something like Java Mission Control, but it, obviously that costs some production. So if you want to use Honest Profile in production, please do. I do know some people have used it, but be aware you're bleeding edge kind of thing. Thanks. Any more questions? Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.